Uh, welcome back to Catholic Reboot. Um, today is the feast day of St. John the Baptist de La Salle, a very great saint and the founder of the uh, Christian Brothers Order. Uh, before I get into that, though, I just want to give a Pope Francis alert. Um, he had come out with a book um, called Let Us Dream, okay? Uh, you know, the, the liberals are always great with these dreams. They're all dreaming, you know. We had Obama dreams of my father, you know. And this idea that when the Pope writes a book, uh, what he has to remember, and I said this in, in other episodes, who is he speaking on behalf of when he writes a book? He's speaking on behalf of himself as a person. It's got absolutely no standing as any part of our faith, uh, the, the deposits of our faith, the doctrine of the faith. Uh, why? Because he's just like anyone else writing a book. Now, why is this dangerous? Because he's not like anyone else. He is the vicar of Christ. He re represents Christ here on earth. And he needs to remember that everything he says, people listen to and may be confused that what he's doing is instituting something we as Catholics need to believe. So I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you, don't buy the book. It's garbage. It's, it's, it's pure garbage. But I'll give you some highlights on why I'm going to tell you not to waste your time. Because I don't think it'll do anything in a sanctifying way for you. Matter of fact, it may even make you question your faith, okay? All right, so he's using these same terms that a lot of uh, politicians and government officials are using, this build back better. And they're all using COVID as this new religion to build back better, new principles, new ideology, right? And uh, when they, they say they need a new principle, which what Pope Francis is, uh, had said is Christ dares us uh, to make something new. Really? I thought Christ said he made all things new, right? Is he daring us to make things new? I mean, when we look at the antiquity of the Catholic Church, um, what was wrong with it? W what do we need new, Holy Father? What is Christ exactly daring us to do new? Well, uh, let's go back to the 1960s when all these Vatican II popes decided that they were speaking on behalf of Christ and that he wanted all things new. They changed our liturgy, right, and the sacraments. They, they changed it all. They, um, they changed the canon of the Mass. They changed canon law. They changed the calendar, liturgical calendar. They changed the prayers at the end of Mass that were nothing but edifying. They changed how you canonize a saint. Um, and they changed the whole structure to the College of Cardinals, right? So real good uh, changes, right? Okay, Catholic Church is doing so much better because they thought that Christ dared us to do something new. This something new has destroyed the church and brought it to its knees. But now, as a good liberal, they double down. They never get called out on all their failures. They just keep going. And so now here comes Pope Francis, and he praises, he praises a guy, uh, Hertelin, who was a writer who actually favored the French Revolution. Okay. How can a Pope praise anyone that would have thought the French Revolution was a good thing? It, it destroyed the Catholic Church in France. It, it made France uh, a free Masonic country, right? Why? Because it followed the same somewhat principles of the United States. Always equality, fraternity, and liberty. This is, this is the sign of liberalism and Freemasonry. They want these three pillars, these three principles. What does Pope Francis talk about in his Let Us Dream? 
he said things like uh, people need to work in a form of fraternity for the common good of man. Hmm. Matter of fact, I dare you to find any mention of God and Christ in this book. No need. Freemasons don't need Christ, right? What else does he do? He says uh, that we need to look at the mockery of ethics of the past. We need to look at the mockery of ethics of the past. So ethics at the at, at the very forefront, ethics are a good thing, right? I mean, to be ethical is good. Oh, no, to him it was a mockery because we really weren't practicing our ethics. Okay, so let's throw out the ethics because people at times, remember, liberals always generalize. They take the exception and they make it the, the general rule. He's, he's a very good, he's very good at that, right? And then focus on this whole idea of fraternity. So he basically, in the book, points to someone that favored the French Revolution and its Masonic ideals, and then he repeats them as his theme under Let Us Dream. Now, what else does he do? Okay, now here, this is a pope. Okay, so what he says matters. Words matter when you're supposed to be representing Christ. But as a pope, he doesn't have the right to come in and destroy the traditions of the faith. He can't do that, right? He has to uphold these traditions. And when he says words, he's got to speak words that uphold the tradition. What am I talking about? When you use the term martyr, what does it mean? It means you're dying for your religious belief. I walk down the street. Somebody comes up to me, puts a gun in my chest and says, give me your money. I say, no, boom, he kills me. He murdered me. I'm not martyred, right? Same guy walks up, puts a gun to my head and says, renounce Christ. I said, no, boom, he kills me. I'm a martyr. You follow me? It There's a difference. Pope Francis calls all those that died because of COVID or in the defense of COVID are martyrs. So goes all these great martyrs of the church who actually died for the faith. Now, now COVID, you see what they're doing with this COVID? And, and by the way, this is why they're shutting anybody down that comes against COVID. It's the new religion. It's the new reset. What they're doing is this build back better. If you want to just take all the words apart and, and re put them, put them back together. What it is, is a reboot on culture. They want to wipe everything else out and start over. Now, we got the head of the Catholic Church assisting them in his terminology of building back better through these kinds of uh, comments. Pope should never use the word martyr unless he's referring to somebody dying for Christ or the faith, period, all right? All right, and, and I know a lot of Nova Soto say, well, you must have misunderstood. This is the problem with this guy. We need a translator every time he opens his mouth or writes a book. That's not what popes do. Popes are clear, okay? The reason I have to watch them is I got to protect my church. It's my right as a Catholic, and I'll die for this church. And if it means that there's a pope that's going to try to take down Christ's church, I'm going to go after him. Why? Because I'm a Catholic. I have the responsibility to defend the church of Christ, the only true church. So this ecumenicalism isn't enough to destroy the Catholic Church. Now we got a new religion that just came in. It's not Protestant, it's COVIDism. I can't tell you how ticked off I am. They let these books go out into the public, right? He also talks about men and women. See, he, he's great at using terminology. And you go, oh, 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 yeah, that's great. And then um, we need to have, uh, we need to be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, okay. Hey, we kind of covered that over the last 2,000 years. Glad you said it, because now it must mean more because you said it. Oh, no, he's got to make it better. He refers to men and women as co-creators. This guy has absolutely no love for God. The only one that could create life is who? God. He's the creator. What do we as human beings do? We procreate. We don't co-create. 
See how he fuzzies up the lines? This is a pope using these terms. Men and women are co-creators. Oh, now we're equal to God. Thank you, Francis. Really making me feel like a good Catholic now. You know, I I, I give him credit for one, one thing he wrote in the book, and he spoke against usury, okay? Which is, it's terrible today. I mean, these payday loans and stuff like that, it's terrible. People are in debt forever. Great. However... What he's supporting when he brings all these groups together are the very big bodies that are creating this usury environment. What do I mean by that? You know, you see so many people getting into the stock mark markets and everything. I never got into them. You know why? Because as part of my profession, I was in the back rooms with a lot of these publicly traded companies. I wouldn't trust them with my money. Why? Because I don't know what they're going to do. They're going to do everything for a profit. They're going to uh, consolidate they're going to merge. They're going to they're going to grow. I'd rather take my money and go to a startup business, give them my money so that they can start up a business, because I know at the root of it, it's going to be good and they're going to employ people. And there ain't, isn't going to be all this culture learning that needs to go on. Right. So when Pope Francis talks about user it, go the whole distance, buddy. Start talking about the culture that's being created in the corporations and the stock market that is anything but Catholic. It's anti-Catholic. Don't touch one piece. If you want to come out boldly, come out completely and start attacking what these multinational corporations are doing. Okay. I'm sorry. This episode is about St. John the Baptist de La Salle. It's just, I got to give you the Pope Francis alerts when they come across because I see so many people so concerned about what are they saying about Trump and what's going on in the Senate and the Congress and what's going on with these reelections. Forget that. Look at your church. Look, what, look at that drama going on. Get your head in the game. Focus on your church. Country, go to hell. It's going to just be another uh, republic that's going to fail. It's, it, it, look, we're going to get hurt. What are we going to get hurt? What are we going to lose? We're going to lose our house. Focus on the church because they're trying to lose your soul and the soul of your children. Focus on these prelates and be like these great saints and fight, fight, fight to save your Catholic church. Don't give in. I, you know, I feel sorry for anybody that tries to convert to Catholicism because it's like this ideal. Like if you ever see a Hollywood movie, when they show a Catholic church, they don't show a Novus Ordo church. They show these beautiful cathedrals. They show people praying. They show the priests and the vestments. Very Catholic, right? When people convert, that's what they're converting for. They're converting for what? The traditions of the Catholic faith. This is what they're converting. They're not converting for this liberalism. They're trying to look for an order in their life. And the Catholic Church in its great traditions, antiquities, that's what it's about. So anybody that, that wants to convert to Catholicism, first thing I tell them is don't go to any Novus Ordo Church. Please. I'll, I'll pick somebody for you because you may as well stay where you're at until we can clean up our church. And that's our responsibility as Catholics. I don't know if you know that. It's not this. we got to stop this indifferentism. It's almost like a new theology. Oh, well. Oh, well. That's a new thing. Instead of saying amen at church, everyone should go, oh, well. Because they'll put up with anything. Stop being indifferent Catholics. Start fighting for the traditional Catholic Church and start letting your priests and your bishops know. Write the Pope. I've written Rome many a times. What are you doing? We are fighting a culture that is apostate and you're helping them. I'm fighting for my kids and my grandkids right now. This guy's going out talking as if he's got no responsibility. I hate to say it. He's got to go. He will destroy this church. They give him any more. It's worse than Biden. You, you put Biden, Obama, and Pope Francis in the same room, and they'll call each other brothers. Fight, fight, fight. Pray to the great saints. Say the rosary, because we got a long road ahead. And like I always say, all you non-Catholics, for whatever reason, 
come back home to the Catholic Church and help us fight. Okay? Be good followers of Christ in his church. Come back and help us fight because we're really losing the battle. So now let's talk about St. John the Baptist um, de La Salle. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's have a happy moment and start talking about the wonderful uh, St. John Baptist de La Salle. You know, being in uh, Chicago, we always think of de La Salle High School, great school. Um, okay, so uh, he was born in 1651, died in 1719. Uh, he had complete dedication uh, to what he saw as God's will for him, right? So it, it completely dominates the life of John uh, Baptist de La Salle. And I'll refer to him as Saint de La Salle. Uh, he was the founder of the Brothers of Christian Schools, or the Christian Brothers. So for any of you that are familiar with the Christian Brothers wine, believe it or not, that order did make a fine wine to uh, help defray costs. He was canonized in 1900, and in 1950, Pope Pius XII named him the patron saint of school teachers. So if you're a school teacher, a special prayer during the day to St. John Baptist de La Salle. He was um, born to, uh, to a nobility or noble family in Reims in 1651, as I said before. And after a very pious youth was ordained a priest at the age of 27, uh, once he received his canon, uh, it was said that you could see him at the altar uh, and that th the view of him at the altar was so sufficient that even unbelievers immediately received the faith because they could see he believed in the real presence of our Lord, which means what? He believed uh, when he was consecrating that the transubstantiation was there, right? Uh, so he wasn't clowning around. Uh, the people uh, would wait for him to come uh, from church and they would consult him. As all the good, holy, uh, saintly priests, that was usually the case. His life was marked by a rule uh, that he set for himself, which was to uh, maintain pure, perfect regularity in all his duties. So he's very orderly. Uh, he became interested in the uh, creation of uh, what they call gratuitous schools for poor and abandoned children. Uh, he himself was invited to help in their education, and he did so. And after directing the teachers for about four years, he decided to join in with them. So uh, this was kind of this, this movement to have the priest involved in the education. Uh, uh, he was opposed by most of the people of the city uh, because they didn't feel that it was befitting of a priest. It was too humiliating uh, for a priest, especially of a cathedral, to be involved in the education. His uh, spiritual director was a virtuous Franciscan, they say, minimum priest, uh, who had encouraged him, saying that for teachers whose vocation is to aid the poor, is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. So he basically supported his actions and stood up for him uh, and said that the only suitable inheritance is the poverty of the Savior, right? Um, so St. John uh, Baptist divested himself of the patrimonial wealth, the wealth of the family, that he still had control of. And then when he took on the religious vows with other co-workers, you know, he just said, that's it, I'm done with this. And you really have to stop and think about this. You've heard this of, about, uh, like, St. Francis. They, they, they gave up big money. So anybody today says, well, you know, maybe later. You know, it's like the rich man came to... Christ and asked him, I've followed all the laws. What more should I do? He said, sell everything you had. And the rich man walked away sad, right? We just can't help it as humans. We like that security uh, that's there. The great saints just chucked it. They realized it was a detriment to their, uh, to their faith and commitment. And I would also say it's a detriment to the church when it gets too rich. Um, his, they said his tender and paternal charity soon sanctified the house 
and the labors, peace reigned and the members of, the, of that new society loved one another sincerely, right? Uh, the Institute developed and spread amid, among thousands, um, and uh, there was a lot of difficulties and persecutions going on that time. So the way they deferred that was by, um, by trying to become more humble, right? And that brought down great graces to them, uh, and what they call the, prov the providence of Christ was more evident in their order. Uh, the founder, of course, uh, St. John the Baptist, died in 1790. Uh, a religious superior said of him, his humility was universal. He never acted without taking counsel, and the opinion of others seemed better to him than his own. Uh, he listened to others in conversation and was never heard to say any word tending to his own advantage. In other words, he never tried to promote his own self-interest. Um, and then accordingly, it's, it was God that he was looking to elevate him, right? So Christ always said, last shall be first, first shall be last. Same idea, right? Um, so this is a, a great model of our faith. And again, uh, what we need to do as good Catholics is we need to look at the lives of these saints. They were here for a reason. It wasn't by happenstance they were brought into our world, into our church, right? And so that's that's Christ saying, look, this this is what you can be. So we all can do this, right? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to have another video to follow this. I'm sorry, again, it's long. But my thought is, if you're done here, you're done here. If you want to know more about the life of St. John the Baptist de La Salle, it's there for you to learn. Turn off Netflix, turn off Fox News, turn off all this nonsense. Invest in your faith. Catholics, come home. It's time. Thank you very much. St. John Baptist de La Salle established a unique group of lay religious men dedicated exclusively to education, the Brothers of the Christian Schools. Today, the educational movement that he began directly impacts close to a million people and continues to inspire all Catholic educators. Born in Reims, France, into a wealthy and influential family on April 30th, 1651, John Baptist de La Salle enjoyed a privileged upbringing. The oldest of 11 children, he was named after John the Baptist, the prophet who heralded Jesus, something he himself would do later in life. De La Salle would become the herald of Christ, bringing the good news of the gospel to poor children all over Europe and eventually to the world. At first, De La Salle was tutored at home and then received a formal education at the College des Bons Enfants in Reims. He decided early on to become a priest. In 1670, at the age of 19, he moved to Paris so that he could study at the Sorbonne, the University of Paris, while residing at the prestigious seminary of St. Sulpice. But when his parents died 18 months later, de La Salle became responsible for the family estate and his six younger brothers and sisters. So he moved back to his hometown and completed his studies there at Reims University, which no longer exists. He was ordained a priest on April 9, 1678 at Reims Cathedral, and he earned a licentiate in theology in 1676 and a doctorate in 1680. Just three weeks after his ordination, his close friend and spiritual advisor, Nicholas Roland, died. In his will, Roland asked de La Salle to oversee a group of nuns that Roland had formed and established in Reims. They needed guidance to attain official recognition from civil and church authorities. De La Salle took on the task and in the process learned much about the poor and about the educational situation in Reims. In March of 1679, de La Salle met Adrian Nayel at the sisters' residence, a layman who had worked in Rouen providing education for poor children for many years. When he learned that a wealthy widow, who was related to de La Salle, had asked Nayel to consider founding a charity school for boys in Reims, de La Salle invited Nayel to stay at his home so that they could consult with others in the town on how to start the proposed school. De La Salle's help was effective, and the school was soon opened. Before long, a second wealthy woman in Reims told Nayel that she also would endow a school, but only if de La Salle would ensure that her money would not be squandered or wasted. De La Salle agreed, but somewhat reluctantly. 
Gradually, and without really being aware of it, he found himself being drawn onto a very different path that would take him into the world of the poor. A world of disadvantaged students, uncultured teachers, and parents chronically oppressed by poverty. De La Salle knew that the teachers of these new schools in Reims were struggling, that they lacked leadership, purpose, and training, and he found himself taking steps to help this small group of men with their work. He invited the teachers into his home for a retreat and some basic teacher training, and later he moved into a new house with them, and the community became known as the Brothers of the Christian Schools. Before long, the brothers became concerned about their future stability and financial security. It was easy for De La Salle to talk about trusting in God's providence. After all, he was a wealthy man by birth, whereas they were poor, with no skills and no prospects. If the schools should fail, they would be back on the streets. In 1683, De La Salle began to give away his wealth to help the poor of Reims and beyond. In the winter of 1683-1684, he used the bulk of his family inheritance to feed the poor during a particularly severe famine. He gave away his entire fortune and so quickly and irrevocably joined his brothers in real poverty. Now they would all be fully dependent on God alone. God, he said, led him in an imperceptible way and over a long period of time, so that one commitment led to another in a way that I did not foresee in the beginning. Church authorities were suspicious of and resisted this new form of lay religious life, and the educational establishment resented the brothers' innovative teaching methods and their insistence on educating people regardless of their ability to pay. But the small community was by now operating a good number of successful parish-based schools for the poor in and around Reims. In 1686, the brothers professed their first vows at Notre Dame Church in Lessa, Later, the brothers opened schools in Paris and throughout France. The La Salle and the brothers would face many challenges, controversies, and setbacks, including legal battles with those who saw the tuition-free schools as a threat to their livelihood. But the mission and the work continued. In the year 1691 in Paris, money was in short supply, and many brothers left. The situation seemed bleak, but de La Salle, Nicolas Foyart, and Gabriel Drolin made what has come to be called the heroic vow, that they would live and work together to establish this society even if they should have to beg and live on bread alone. John Baptist de La Salle and his brothers succeeded in creating a network of schools throughout France that featured the teaching of reading in French instead of Latin, which was the norm, students grouped according to ability, the integration of religious instruction with secular subjects, and well-prepared teachers with a sense of vocation and mission. De La Salle also pioneered programs for training lay teachers, Sunday classes for working young men, and one of the first institutions in France for delinquent youth. In 1715, De La Salle left Paris and retired to saint Jean in Rouen. There he continued to write, to teach novice brothers about prayer, and to minister to prisoners. Four years later, racked by asthma and chronic rheumatism, his health declined. As he lay dying, he was asked if he accepted his sufferings. De La Salle responded with the last words that he will ever say, Yes, I adore God guiding me in all the events of my life. John Baptist de La Salle died on Good Friday, April 7, 1719, age 68. His life's journey had taken him places he could not have imagined 40 years earlier. De La Salle was buried on Holy Saturday in a side chapel of the local parish church, Saint Sever. Since it was Holy Week, the more solemn funeral rituals were delayed until the following week. Throughout Rouen, and soon throughout the society, word spread, the saint is dead. And what is his legacy? He left behind a small community of some hundred men grouped into 23 communities that called itself the Brothers of the Christian Schools, a group that was not yet officially recognized by either the church or the state and a number of mostly parish-based schools for poor boys, schools that were only fully appreciated by those who attend them. But the impact of his life, work, and influence was just beginning. Today, 300 years later, there are approximately 6,000 Christian brothers and 77,000 lay colleagues participating in over 1,000 LaSallian ministries spread around the world, serving almost a million souls, most of them children. De La Salle's charism, educational spirituality, 
and extensive writings inspired Catholic educators not only in his own time, but continues to inspire educators from many different traditions today. St. John Baptist de La Salle was canonized as a saint in 1900 and was named the patron saint of all teachers in 1950.